From seizing military ships and buying airplanes to predicting weather patterns, hedge fund strategies stretch far and wide. So here's five of the most common hedge fund investing strategies. And thank you to Daily Upside, a free business and finance newsletter, for partnering for this video. First off, we have short-only hedge funds. And these funds bet that the price of an asset will go down and they profit off that. This strategy usually involves a ton of investigative research to uncover overvalued companies or even sometimes straight up corporate fraud. Among the most famous short sellers is Jim Kanos, founder of Kinecos Associates. He first rose to fame back in the early 2000s when everyone was very bullish on this company called Enron. Eventually he decided to short it while it was trading at around $90 per share. After a great deal of waiting, the share price eventually hit zero and the company had to file for bankruptcy. More recently though, he was short on Wirecard, a German payment processing company. Soon enough, he was proven right as the company filed for insolvency and its share price plummeted to practically zero, as allegations of fraud started emerging and even some senior management from Wirecard eventually fled the country. In this short trade, his fund made about $100 million. Now those are examples of shorts going well, but Jim Kanos has been short Tesla for quite a few years now, and that investment obviously hasn't gone well. Tesla stock has done nothing but continue going up until it's past the 1 trillion market cap. Short only funds do come with some controversy. On the one hand, there's people that believe that you shouldn't be able to bet on the downfall of a company or of a particular person, while on the other hand, some people believe that it helps keep the markets in check by uncovering some harsh but important truths. And if you're curious to see what a short position's investment thesis looks like, here's Bill Ackman's hedge fund, Pershing Square's short thesis on Herbalife. It's 334 pages long and it basically walks through their findings and why they thought Herbalife was a pyramid scheme and decided to bet on its downfall. Now this happened over five years ago and Bill Ackman's hedge fund actually ended up exiting that position unsuccessfully as Herbalife is still around and is doing reasonably well. And by the way, Pershing Square isn't a short only fund, they employ many other strategies as well. Next up, we have activist investing. And simply put, activist hedge funds try to look for companies with unrealized value and then try to unlock that value by actively pushing for the management team to make changes. It's also what's earned hedge fund managers headlines like why the world's CEOs fear Paul Singer. Now as a hedge fund, you do need significant money to make this happen. See, if I bought a share of Samsung and tried to demand for changes, they would just laugh at me because I only own one share and that means nothing to them. On the other hand, if a hedge fund comes in and buys 5% of the company, then all of a sudden they do have that power and that influence to ask for changes. Among the most famous activist hedge funds in the world is Elliott Management, founded by Paul Singer. And here's their presentation proposal urging Samsung Electronics to make a set of changes back in 2016. As you can see, they like to call it a unique opportunity, the Samsung Electronics Value Enhancement Proposals. I guess that's just a fancy way of saying that they want some changes. Firstly, as you can see, they explain why they think there's unrealized value in the company through some financial metrics like the price to earnings versus that of the main competitors or the price to book value as well. And then they propose a set of changes. Among some of the changes that they propose are reorganizing the group's structure as it's just too complex at the moment, changing the dividend policy, or also adding independent directors. And if you're interested in learning more about the deck, I'll leave it down in the description. Make sure you hit that like and that subscribe along the way. But before we continue, I wanna talk about the Daily Upside. They're a free business and finance newsletter with over 200,000 subscribers, myself included, when I signed up about half a year ago. It was founded by a former investment banker who spent a decade on Wall Street. Every weekday, they deliver a morning brief, followed by more detailed stories that are shaping the business world. It's about a five minute read giving a high level unbiased analysis with an occasional dose of wit to keep things interesting. Recently, I've been enjoying their weekend edition newsletters which goes deeper into niche industries. This last week's, for example, dove into the health and wellness sector which covered everything from Peloton's M&A strategy to Apple's future in the fitness world. So if you want to stay on top of the latest business news, click the link in the description to sign up to the Daily Upside. It's completely free and if you don't like it, you can always unsubscribe as well. All right, back to the video. The next hedge fund strategy we'll look at is global macro. And overall with global macro, they're not necessarily tied to any specific asset class, meaning that they might invest in currencies, they might invest in fixed income, commodities, or even just plain old stocks as well. And generally this is a top-down approach, meaning that they look at macro things, the economy, the regions, things like that, industry trends, instead of actually getting into specific details of how one company is performing. One of the most renowned hedge fund managers in global macro is George Soros, and in particular, one specific trade that gave him the nickname of the man who broke the Bank of England. 
This was back in the 1990s when England decided to join an agreement to not let their currency fluctuate more than a set limit relative to the Deutsche Mark, which was Germans, Germany's currency at the time. That was known as a semi-peg, but George Soros actually figured out that it wouldn't be sustainable for England to stay in this agreement, and so they would eventually have to exit it in order for their economy to continue prospering. He was so confident about this, he decided to place a massive trade worth $10 billion back then to short the British pound, so expecting it to drop in value if they exited the agreement. That did indeed happen, and George Soros made $1 billion off that trade, essentially giving him international notoriety. Other well-known global macro players include Bridgewater Associates, founded by Ray Dalio, as well as Brevin Howard, founded by Alan Howard. The fourth strategy we'll look at is event-driven, and this involves getting in and out of positions when there's big corporate events. And by corporate events, I don't mean like corporate parties, instead it's things like M&A deals, restructurings, or spin-offs. When this type of major event happens, there's often mispriced securities, mainly because they're very complex transactions, and so it takes time for investors to fully understand them and incorporate that changes into the price. As you can imagine, for the hedge fund side, this is quite a short-term position, meaning that they're in and out relatively quickly, maybe in a few weeks or months. Within event-driven hedge funds, there's actually multiple different strategies, and among the most common ones which we'll look at is merger arbitrage. Now, if you don't know what arbitrage means, it's just taking advantage of the difference in prices between, say, two or more markets. To give you a simplified example, if a stock of a company trades in two different markets, which is a real thing, by the way, like, say, the New York Stock Exchange and the Tokyo Stock Exchange, and it's trading in New York at $10 per share, and it's trading in Tokyo at $12 per share, you could buy the shares in New York and sell the shares in Tokyo for what's basically a $2 risk-free profit. That's arbitrage in action. Now, if you do this enough times, eventually that discrepancy is going to balance out, primarily because of supply and demand. Now, let's look at an example to do with a merger arbitrage. Let's say that company A announces that it wants to acquire company B. Now, for that to go through, company A is going to have to pay more than the current share price, or else why would people in company B decide to sell, right? So suppose company A places a bid to acquire company B for $100 a share, but company B is still trading at $90 per share, so actually below the announced acquisition price. And that discrepancy is mainly because there's some uncertainty with the deal. For example, the regulators could step in and say no to it, there could be some tax issues, some contract issues, and so on. In that kind of scenario, a hedge fund would buy shares in company B at $90 per share, essentially locking in a $10 profit if that deal actually does go through. Now, how do they know that the deal will close? The short answer is that there is no guarantee, so they don't really know, but they do conduct intense research and try to figure out the probabilities, and because they're more knowledgeable than the average investor, they tend to be a bit more right than them. That said, this is a very simplified example. It does get a lot more complex in real life. And the last strategy we'll look at is long-short equity, which is probably the most common hedge fund strategy out there. As the name implies, this involves going long, so betting that a position goes up, while at the same time going short a position, so hoping that it goes down. Now, these two typically are quite related, so in similar fields. For example, let's look at something in the sportswear industry. Take Nike and Under Armour. If a hedge fund feels that Nike is undervalued while Under Armour is overvalued, then they'll go long on one and go short on the other. By doing so, they eliminate the risk of the sportswear industry on the whole. For example, say if there was another lockdown and so people stopped doing sports, they had to stay at home the whole time, that would mean that the share prices in the sportswear industry would typically go down. But because they have a long and a short position, they're able to mitigate that risk. So their returns would purely be from Nike outperforming Under Armour and not from the industry's overall performance. As for how they identify Nike as undervalued or Under Armour as overvalued, that has to do with qualitative research, so things like what the industry is looking like, what kind of management team there is, as well as more quantitative stuff like financial modeling, looking at future cash flows, and things like that. It is quite a complex mix though. And these are just five of the common hedge fund investing strategies out there. Let me know in the comments if you want a part two where I can go over some of the other big strategies like quants, distressed companies, or funds of funds as well. And here's some additional resources that I've read throughout the years and I found quite useful to do with hedge funds. More general resources include the Economist Guide on Hedge Funds, which is very informational, but that said it is more of a guide rather than a story. The second one is Hedge Fund Market Wizards, which is a great read to get into the minds of some of the top hedge fund managers out there. And if you want something a bit more specific, so looking at specific hedge fund managers, there's three main books I recommend. The first one is Confidence Game, which goes over Bill Ackman's very early beginnings and how he was successful throughout the financial crisis. The second one is The Man Who Beat the Market, which basically goes over Jim Simmons' quant fund called Renaissance Capital, which arguably has the best performance in the world. Lastly, I'd recommend Fooling Some of the People All of the Time by David Einhorn, 
as he shares how he went about shorting Lehman Brothers, which eventually went bankrupt in 2008. That's all for this video, I hope you found it useful, hit that like, hit that subscribe if you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you in the next one.